Well, I've shared with some of you that it is especially wonderful to be here with you this morning, especially on Mother's Day, because Marion is actually my hometown. Um, my parents um, still live here. I grew up on the edge of Marion College, and for some of you younger folks, that's now the sprawling Indiana Wesleyan. But uh, when I was young, it was a very small college. And I grew up learning about Jesus at Grace United Methodist Church. But it was in a teepee at College Wesleyan Church where I learned about a lifelong relationship of love with Jesus. And I suppose that this teepee was kind of a children's uh, version of a good old-fashioned tent revival. And of course, there was an altar call. And never being one to rush into anything in my life, I did actually date my husband for seven years before I decided it was a good idea to get married, and we will be celebrating 31 years of marriage in June. But as they had this call to ask us to come forward, anybody that wanted to begin this lifelong love relationship that they could go up and be prayed with and so we were supposed to, those of us sitting were supposed to have our heads down and be praying but of course I had to check this out what does this mean so I'm trying to pray and and look and see and it didn't seem like anything was amiss the, they came forward and kneeled and an adult prayed for them and I kind of watched those kids the rest of the day to see anything of any Something strange or weird was happening with them and it wasn't they just seemed happier than usual so I thought about it all morning so when I got home um, after lunch was cleaned up and everybody kind of scattered to do their next thing I kneeled down in front of our brown refrigerator. Anybody remember those brown refrigerators? And I don't know why. Maybe because that day I had learned that God is a big, big God. And a refrigerator, it's pretty big. And good things come out of it. So there I, as a young child, maybe seven or eight, I kneeled in front of our brown refrigerator and ask for God for this kind of relationship with Jesus. And I was filled with a love and a warmth, and I knew then God was real. But it was later, seeking after Jesus in things like Mrs. Brown's Sunday school class, I am sure that if in heaven, God saints people that she was a saint because we were heathens. But she kept showing up every Sunday and trying to teach us. And it was in places like Pine Creek and Adventure Camp and Epworth Forest and MYF and JC Body Shop. That's where I learned to follow Jesus. But there was a prayer that came much later that changed the course of my life. And it was really a simple prayer and maybe a dangerous prayer, but I didn't realize it at the time. It turned into a get out of the boat kind of prayer. I mean, let me tell you how it started. It started with my plan for how my life was going to go forward. And don't you think God just laughs when we tell God our plans of how our life is going to be? I was a married, stayed-at-home mom. We had three little kids, each two years apart. That really seemed like a good idea at the time. And now the youngest was about to start kindergarten. Can I get a praise, Jesus? <laughs> and it was again at Vacation Bible School. Being an adult volunteer, trying to herd feral cats, oh, I mean God's precious little cherubs, to their different vacation Bible school stations. And I was at the snack station where I was charged with opening foil packets of Rice Krispie treats and pouring juice and then wiping up that juice, juice and then repeating, opening a package, pouring juice and wiping it up. When somebody said, hey, the church is going to start a food pantry. And we think you're just the person to lead our volunteers um, that are going to work directly with our pantry families. So I said, let me think about it and the obligatory 
churchy response, I'll pray about it. But I added, here's the deal. I'm going back to work when my sweetest little one goes to kindergarten. And you can add a big old God laugh right there. So I eventually did say yes. But I was really nervous about what that would look like. So I started calling a whole bunch of churches that had food pantries and asking them how did they do it. And I got to tell you, I was taken aback by the responses that I heard about the people who were coming to be served by them. I could tell that they had become really jaded and hard-hearted, and not everyone. But I realized that it would be really easy to become equally susceptible to this. So I started to pray. And here was my simple prayer. It that God would give me the uh, God's eyes for the people that came to us. And that God would give me God's heart and God's love for the people that came. And God would give me words of healing and wisdom for the people. And I taught my volunteers this pray, prayer, and we said it every time the pantry door opened. We prayed it um, together, and then I prayed it as I walked to the person I was going to serve. And the pantry, it became this beautiful place, the place the church had envisioned, a place where people were loved and cared for. And we saw wonderful prayers answered for our guests. But the most amazing thing that happened is that prayer changed us. And so let's look at our scripture about what it has to say about transforming prayer. And I have to admit, this prayer and others like it always make me a little nervous. I ha I'm, I'm hesitant to talk about it. Because I've heard lots and lots of stories from folks who have prayed earnest prayers. And they weren't prayers like the song lyric says, Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz or a color TV and the other things in the song. But these were heartfelt prayers. Prayers for healing for people with cancer. Heartfelt prayers. And then there's a scripture and there are others like it that seem to apply just with enough faith, God will answer. And I have seen people pray with the utmost faith, and yet people die. And it's this tension that nearly stopped me from living into my call as a pastor. What answer would I give someone when they ask me such a question, why did my loved one die? We all were praying. And platitudes like, God needed them more in heaven or everything happens for a reason. Folks, that is not true. There are horrible things that happen that God had no intention for us, and God weeps with us when they happen. But God's with us in the aftermath. And while grappling with this, I happened to come, off a, come across a book that I was listened to on audio as I was driving to pick, out my, pick up my daughter from college, and it's called In God's Presence. It's a book by Marjorie um, Hewitt Suhaki, and she tells the story of this church that was utterly devastated and just not knowing what to do next when a young mom who had been so vibrant and loving in their church that she died and she had young children. And the church had just surrounded her in prayer, yet she died. And they were left grappling with the question of why? Where is God in this? But she continues the story of these children, her children. And she tells that somehow the community of believers kept surrounding the family. And how these children grew to thrive. And the realization set in that there had been healing. And it came through their dogged determination to keep on loving these little ones in this family. And if you pull that one moment of this story out where the mother dies, you might say that God didn't heal and God didn't answer prayers. 
And if you pull out our scripture this morning, out of context, it can be easy to misinterpret. In fact, that was one of the things that my seminary professors would hound at us over and over and over again, that you cannot take a passage out of its context, out of the context of what's happening at the time and in the context of the scripture, the teaching around it, and what's happening in the larger scope of the biblical narrative. And our passage this morning comes at the end of a teaching that some of us know as the Sermon on the Mount. You can find that in Matthew 5 through 7. I invite you to read it this week so you can kind of have an understanding of what I'm talking about this morning. And this is in that passage, Jesus talking, and he's asking us to forgo our anger and retaliation, to love our enemies, and to forgive those who have injured us, and to control our criticism of others. And honestly, how can we fill, fulfill those demands and manifest the kingdom of God on earth? And these verses remind us that it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And that it is only by persistently asking, seeking, and knocking at heaven's door that through prayer we find the grace to obey these impossible demands. Solely through the tenacious dependence on God's graciousness, can we deal graciously with those who provoke a negative reaction in, in us? And we get further evidence that this is what the passage is talking about when we look at the parallel scripture in Luke 11. You know, there's, we see the different stories that repeated again in the, some of the different gospels. And this was a similar story in Luke 11. But instead of the part where it says the father gives good things to his children, in Luke, instead of good things, it uses the language of the Holy Spirit. And in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it tells us that the Holy Spirit that makes possible human love of our enemies. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers us to love our enemies. And this good gift of the Holy Spirit enables us to live in a way of love and goodness. And our scripture talks about seeking and knocking and the Father giving good gifts in the next verse, the verse in verse 12, we read verse um, 7 through 11. It says, therefore, you should treat people in the same way that you want people to treat you. Jesus boils down this extensive teaching down to do unto others as you would have them do to you. The only way we can do that is by the seeking after God and God's good gift of the Holy Spirit that helps us to have those fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. The very things that are going to be required of us to love the folks around us. God answered my prayer to see people as God sees them. I don't always get it right and to love them with God's heart, to have God's words of love and healing. And of course, that changed my plans. I didn't go back to work that next year. In fact, I spent nine years at that pantry serving our neighbors. I went on to become a pastor, and I still consider myself a pastor, except my parish in God's church at Hannah Commons. Hannah Commons is a newly opened 55-unit permanent supportive housing apartment community where all the residents have at least experienced one year of chronic homelessness. One of my residents has been home, had been homeless for 42 years, and one of my residents actually was born on the White River and has spent her whole life living outside and she's trying to learn how do you now live inside. They all have some life-limiting disability, and many of them have a severe mental illness like schizophrenia. And when Jesus walked this earth, I imagine my residents, if he came back now, would be the very ones that he saw and touched and loved. That prayer changed who, who I saw and how I saw them. 
And I promise you, without that prayer, I would never have gone from a Fisher's suburban housewife to those whose family is now 55 formerly homeless people with disabilities. I mean, think about that. There's no way that happened, but God's giving me his eyes and his heart. But it's through this journey of prayer that I can tell you I have found more joy, more contentment, and more purpose than I have ever imagined or desired. And what would happen if you started to pray this prayer? Praying it as that difficult family member approached, or when that frustrating neighbor or coworker starts speaking, or praying it for the person who has a difficult, different theological understanding, or who votes differently than you, or praying it for the people who come to events like the outreach like the egg hunt and the other things that your pastor Laura is leading you in. Or when someone comes to you and asks you to help in a ministry that's getting ready to start here. Our scripture this morning comes in the same teaching where Jesus taught the disciples to pray. It's the prayer we know as the Lord's Prayer. Maybe saying my simple but dangerous prayer is the very thing that God uses to bring the kingdom of earth and you get to be a participant. Will you pray with me? God, teach us to pray. Help us to be attentive to your spirit. Fill us with the tenacity to seek you and your ways in all things. And may your kingdom come and your will be done in our lives and in this community. Amen. Well, I think we're done a little early. May you go and get the table at your favorite restaurant on this Mother's Day. <laughs> and may you go from this place praying to see as God would have you see and to love as God would have you to do. And may your actions bring forth the kingdom of heaven here and now in this place. Go in God's peace and love. Amen.